Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started to keep this, this train on time. I'm Pamela Vickers, and I'm really excited to be here. Um, we're going to jump right in. Um, do you all remember this talk or this blog post? A lot of people were sharing it. A lot of people had really strong opinions about it, as they often do on the internet. And uh, Jeff Atwood of Coding Horror was making some points about how all of these learn to code efforts might be kind of fundamentally flawed in a few areas. And uh, his major points were that uh, it assumes that more code in the world is an inherently desirable thing. It assumes that coding is the goal. It puts the method before the problem. It assumes that adding naive novice, not even sure they like this whole programming thing coders to the workforce is a net positive for the world. And it also implies that there's a thin, easily permeable membrane between learning to program and getting paid to program professionally. So some of his assertions had some merit, but a lot of his post reads that as if there are these checkpoints and these mandatory hour of codes you must, you must perform every year. And what really stood out to me is that these two points have nothing to do with learning to code problems and problems that have much more to do with how existing developers welcome developing developers uh, into the developer community and into the workforce. A lot of people who disagreed disagreed very strongly. Uh, Zed Shaw is one of them. But a lot of the people who were disagreeing had this context and this contact with new developers. And so they were pretty kind of appalled at some of the points that uh, Jeff Atwood was making. Um, and Zed Shaw wrote this entire rebuttal called, please don't become anything, especially not a programmer. And the people who agreed seemed to mostly live in the comments section. Uh, and they all seem to talk about new developers and new coders in a very abstract sense. It didn't sound like very many of them had even met anybody that was on that learning to code path. So the new developers aren't just faceless drones that are coming and like typing things into terrible websites and taking jobs. They're all people that are learning this for very legitimate reasons and very different reasons. They have different backgrounds, different experiences, and we really only benefit by welcoming them and, make, and helping them succeed. So I'm definitely not saying that everyone should learn to code, but that anyone should be able to. And uh, <laughs> How we greet them originally in, their, in the process really shapes the kind of developers that they're going to become. And um, the journey is a shared adventure between the new developers and the existing developers. And getting over some first major hurdles will really impact whether they succeed or not. So this talk is largely how we can help them get over that hurdle. And if you are finding yourself as the one trying to get over the hurdle, maybe you'll get a few ideas of how to clear that jump. So meet Tenderfoot. She's going to be who we follow to see what the average experience of someone learning a new difficult thing can be like. Her ultimate goal is to scale this mountain, but she's starting here. and. Each level that we go through is going to describe a certain stage of learning. And I'm basing these stages of learning on some research done in the 70s by a psychologist. And they are unconscious incompetence, where you don't know what you don't know. We're calling it the dark and foggy forest. Conscious incompetence, where you know what you don't know, or the valley before the climb. Conscious competence, where you know what you know, which is the steeply sloping ascent in Tenderfoot's world. And finally, unconscious competence, where you don't know what you know. Or the clouds, essentially. So this forest on the other side of the canyon, the dark and foggy forest, this is level one. Tenderfoot can't even see the mountain from where she is. Uh, she knows there probably is a mountain, but she doesn't even know that she's going to have to cross this ridiculous canyon to get there. And this is a place in the learning to code journey where a lot of times people just start with 
how do I learn to code? And if you look really closely, you can see that on every one, there's like millions of results. So this is where we introduce a new character uh, named Bingle, clearly. And Tenderfoot can ask Bingle anything, but Bingle has no idea what Tenderfoot's trying to accomplish. So at the start, some of the answers help or hurt. So as she goes through her journey, she will definitely learn how to use Bingle better, but at first, Bingle can almost be a burden. Uh, much like Scarecrow from Wizard of Oz, when Tenderfoot asked Bingle, how do I learn to code? She's told many different conflicting things. Oh, hey, that way is a very nice way. Who said that? Don't be silly, Toto. Scarecrows don't talk. It's pleasant down that way, too. That's funny. Wasn't he pointing the other way? Of course, people do go both ways. Unfortunately, Tenderfoot at this point has to decide on her first few steps all on her own. Raven Covington, an Atlanta Rails Girls member, once told me, as I began learning, I found there was so much great content out on the internet, which is both awesome and overwhelming. It was difficult for me to chart my own path and figure out where to go next. So Tenderfoot, like Raven and like Dorothy, must pick a direction somewhat arbitrarily and pursue it. So in the dark, she picks a direction and just goes for it. Step by uninformed step, she begins making her way to the edge of the trees. But now we're gonna talk about the mountain. This mountain on the other side has multiple levels. Uh, sorry. And on each level, we'll find different people in different stages of learning hiking up and down. So at the tip top is where we find those in level four. They are the unconscious competence crowd. They don't remember climbing the mountain. They might not even remember that they're on a mountain at all in the first place. And all they know is just kind of their life in the clouds and they're pretty happy that way. But occasionally, one will wake up, they'll stretch, they'll fly down, and they'll see who might be further down the mountain. And they'll try and help them back up since they remember how they got there. They are, in some learning models, in a stage described as reflective competence, uh, or conscious competence of unconscious competence. So it's likely that you've worked with someone kind of like this where they are snoozing, they don't really remember much. You can go to them for the, the questions that are more highly technical in nature. Maybe what tool do I use? You can go to them for a code review. But when we are really lucky, you get to work with one of these people, the level five people, who they can answer those hard, challenging questions. They can answer the fundamental questions as well and they're patient with you and let you catch up to where they are and make sure that their explanations actually helped you. So we'll find others in the mountain community in the level two, the conscious incompetence stage, and level three, the conscious competence stage. They are all kind of climbing together. A lot of them are doing solo journeys as well. And you find that they are the ones who kind of go back and look at the people in the earlier stages more often to see if they need help. So if we were to pin your mark anywhere on the mountain, have you already kind of picked out where you might be? You know what stage you're in? If you're kind of new but kind of have your footing a little bit, you might see that you're in the conscious incompetence stage or Maybe you've been doing it for a little while and you're feeling pretty comfortable with what your tools are and what your frameworks are, so conscious competence. Or maybe you're pretty self-aware and you know that you live in the clouds. But what we should all kind of aim towards and what we should aspire to be are the reflective competence folks. That we can hang out on the top of the mountain, but we are also going back and bringing people up with us. 
So back to Tenderfoot, she's not even seeing the mountain yet. She's just going through the forest, hoping for the best. She's not scared, it's not scary, but it's just a big, vast forest. She's been asking for Bingle for help. He's been doing his best, providing basic directions. She's filling her knapsack with lots and lots of tools. She's got some JavaScript in there, some Python, some HTML, some CSS, some Ruby. She's filling it, and the knapsack's getting heavier, and everything is getting mixed up. She'll reach in to pull one tool and grab the wrong one. She doesn't even notice because she doesn't even know why those things are in her knapsack to begin with. Her route, imperfect and direct, but she still makes it to the edge of the forest. She steps out of the dark forest and sees a glimmer of light. She hikes up to the canyon ledge and sees a couple of mountaineers on the other side. So she's pretty excited. She thinks she's done it. She's made it at this point. So she kind of waves at them, but they don't really notice her right away. So she writes a note on a paper plane and sends it across. She says, hey, new friends, how do I get across this canyon? Thanks. So you've probably seen the equivalent of this somewhere. There's that question on Stack Overflow or someone who finds your, your uh, local Slack community, maybe even IRC if they're a little bit more adventurous. And they're asking for help and direction, but they're asking something huge and vague. But that might be their first contact with the developer community at all, and I think that's kind of frightening. I took a look at the Learn Programming Reddit because I heard some really good things and I heard a lot of people were getting a lot of good advice from there. And I found it's a pretty supportive community, but there are people there who think they're being helpful and kind of could take a look at their messaging because even with a good response, they can have a lot of discouragement just packaged right in. And uh, so let's say Tenderfoot had written this post. It says, I want to really dig into programming, but I'm feeling a bit overwhelmed. They said, I read posts here, and I'm absolutely lost in the amount of technical jargon and such. More than jargon, I'm worried about the mathematical aspects of programming. I've struggled for most of my educational career with anything beyond advanced algebra. Can anyone give me some insight into what level of math I should be proficient in if I want to go anywhere with programming? The top voted reply was really long, uh, pretty well intentioned, but it began with these, this series of questions. The first thing you want to do is take a look at yourself. Do you like math? Do you like logic problems? Are you good at breaking complex problems into parts? If you answered yes to one or more of those, keep reading. If that stuff sounds like a drag, please save yourself some time and look into something else. That's all that programming is, and if you delve deeper, you will find just that. Unfortunately, or fortunately, at the end of this was some really great advice, but if someone's already feeling kind of out of their element and flailing, I don't know if they would have gotten that far. Alternatively, Sarah May wrote this post about programming just not being math at all. And if you aren't familiar, she is one of the ones who wrote the Rails Bridge curriculum. So she discovered this early in the process, and she says that adult students who came to the workshop came from a very wide range of backgrounds, and she noticed that people with a math background did fine, of course, but people with a heavy language background often did better. She said when she worked with high schoolers, she noticed that the bilingual kids took to it more quickly as well. So despite all of the computer science background she had and the conversations she might have had with other people, she determined something pretty profound that programming is just not math. So it's kind of a big difference between this idea and someone who has maybe a little bit more hands-on that observation. So what I'll suggest is consider every paper airplane you encounter to be more like a delicate paper plane. And we want to be kind, we want to be encouraging, we want to be honest and set expectations. But just remember that that response that they receive from you might be their first and then ultimately their last communication with someone in the developer community. So Tenderfoot's waiting on her reply. 
She's still reading, typing away. She's learning all of the things without really learning anything. And she gets a message reply. It says, haven't you heard of a bridge? So she's, she feels kind of sad and silly at the same time. She's worried that maybe she's kind of stumbled into an area of folks who aren't really that interested in helping. I found this post as well. It says, why are experienced programmers so hostile toward beginners? They said, it's usually assumed that I haven't done my own research, which is never the case. For every helpful reply, it seems I'll get four or five useless replies attempting to call me out for my own laziness. Which, that just really hurt me a lot, because I know I've seen that as well. Fortunately, this message isn't that aggressive. Maybe it's just a little smug. So she still sticks around and gets another message. It says, are you asking how to build a bridge? So that feels a little bit better. Maybe she's ready to keep going. But what could she have done better when she was writing her own message, asking? Stack Overflow has a guide to asking the perfect question. And it's pretty long, but my summary is essentially start with a golden rule. Imagine you're trying to answer the question. Uh, provide context, but maybe not too much. Don't, don't include your entire code base, maybe just the relevant bits. Frame the problem, describe the tools you're using, and describe what you've tried already. And uh, yeah, provide the right sample code and the right data. And write something articulately. Don't just throw something together when you're frustrated, throw it up there, because the less someone has to interpret themselves, the more helpful they can be. But what the guy doesn't say is that you should really consider the same things when you're writing an answer. So golden rule, provide context. Really make sure that you explain your thought process and how you got to the suggestion you're proposing so that it's not just a magical answer that they just take and run with but don't really learn from. So this time she thinks about her message and tries to provide a little bit more context. She says, I've just found this canyon and I'd like to cross it. I don't know how wide or how deep it is, but I see that some of you have made it across. Can you tell me what you did in order to get there? I'd like to build a bridge, but I'm not sure what materials to use. This time she gets a longer reply back. It says, hi, Tenderfoot. Crossing the canyon is super easy. All you need to do is grab your foo and then bar the baths. But make sure you don't baz the bar or else the foo will bezizzle. See you soon. <laughs> Have you heard the phrase drinking from the fire hose? Yes? Maybe you know what that feels like. Um, much like our Tenderfoot Redditor from before, it's really easy as a new learner to get lost in the vocabulary among all the other things someone's trying to learn. So this is a pretty common image in whenever people talk about learning but it just shows what people are really learning when they're learning Ruby on Rails. And it's so big, like we have to look at it in pieces. So there's web stuff, there's operating system stuff, there's database stuff, deployment, command line, we have text editors, definitely get hung up on that as early as possible. Um, what else do we have here? We have uh, actually Ruby, managing Ruby, managing the dependencies, then we have the Rails framework, which is probably someone's first exposure, not probably, but likely someone's first exposure to ideas like MVC and RESTful APIs. Then we have Git, which is pretty important, and then GitHub, and knowing that they're actually not the same thing. That's kind of important, but takes a minute for people. Then we have Agile, capital A, and then testing. Also, definitely have lots of early opinions on testing. So, all of that, super easy. And we kind of run into this, where Rails isn't really easy, even though that's what's often packaged up in a code school or in a workshop, it's approachable. It doesn't look terrifying on site, necessarily. But when we say things are easy or simple or just do this thing, it really can cause problems for the people who are in that mode where they are drinking from the fire hose. Because when you're drinking from the fire hose, literally nothing is easy. But then at the same time, does that mean we should change our vocabulary when we're talking to someone who's learning? 
Is a string just always going to be a string? Sarah Simon, who was an English major and then decided to go to uh, Turing School, she wrote down a takeaway, a few takeaways, but the one that I'm going to tell you about is about literacy. So she says, trying to understand something without having the vocabulary to speak coherently about it is a lost cause. Pay your dues and learn the system before anything else. Because by building fluency, you allow connections to fall naturally into place. And with fluency, you'll be able to do incredible things. So there's a responsibility on both sides of the canyon. When mentors provide context and definitions when using programming specific terms and phrases, it removes assumptions and it can provide illumination to the person who is receiving the information. And when mentees catalog and really learn new terms and ideas they're exposed to, they can receive better help. It can be more specific and more precise. So Tenderfoot spends some time parsing her note. She uses Bingle as best as she can to translate some of the message. And some of it starts to make sense to her. But she's still stuck on a few things. All you need to do is grab your foo and then bar the baths. She looks in her knapsack, but she doesn't have a foo available to bar the baths. Getting tools and environment set up, even as an experienced developer, feels at best tedious and at worst impossible. When you are installing tools to install other tools and dependencies, it starts to feel like installationception. Sorry about that, we'll just move on. Uh, so when things go right, it can be confusing. But when things go wrong, it is both confusing and frustrating. And if you're in a position to help someone get set up, when that frustration sets in, it's kind of, you have to be mindful that you don't let them experience the brunt of that frustration. Because uh, then we can ostracize them, and they're already in a pretty vulnerable position. And I'm guilty of some of these, so I know that they happen. I've seen all of these happen probably at almost every installation fest I have ever gone to for any workshop. Um, but we try to get ahead of it now and say, hey, don't make those jokes. They're not actually funny. So here's a difficult question that you've probably heard. How do I get RVM installed on in my 1995 ThinkPad? Well, this is a horrible answer. Get a new MacBook Pro. Here's another difficult question. I'm having issues installing anything on my Windows or Linux machine. Any ideas why? Well, here's a horrible answer, because everything's just harder on Windows and Linux, or replace whatever OS you really feel strongly about. So just don't, just don't do this at all. Uh, even tongue in cheek, which I think programmer humor tends to be kind of on the negative side, and someone not just steeped in that sort of uh, humor, it's kind of off-putting. Uh, and instead, what we should do is use these difficult installations to show that that's just part of it. Experienced people run into these things all the time. It's easy to be like, rah, rah, programming's so much fun, it's going to change your life. But then there are these moments where you're like, yeah, it did change my life. That is true. Um, so use these opportunities to show them how you think and how you approach these problems in your day to day, because it's going to be part of their life, too, if they keep pursuing it. So back to Tenderfoot. Still doesn't have a foo. She looks for one, but no luck. She asks Bingle, where do I get a foo? Bingle's not super helpful, just offers, where do I get some food? And given her experience with asking questions from before, she waits a really long time before asking again. But finally, realizing she's not making any progress, she sends another message. She asks, sorry, what is a foo? I can't seem to find one. Sorry for asking so many questions. Well, this reply, she gets quickly, Ugh, did I say a foo? I meant to say a north. Have a great day. So here she is. She spent precious daylight looking for a foo, but what she really needed was a north. When we have tutorials with out-of-date information and no version numbers, or when we assume someone's using a Unix shell, or really making any assumption at all, we can send a tenderfoot in the wrong direction for an indefinite amount of time, and they might be too hesitant to come back when it's not working for them. So in the same vein of write code for the future developer, 
Think of that when you're putting helpful information out into the world. Make sure that it won't send someone in the wrong direction. And check in whenever possible after you've given someone some direction because just a quick, did that work for you, might save them hours or days in the process of what they're trying to learn or build. So now that she knows that she's looking for a north, she's able to find one. Yay, it's exciting. <laughs> so she reviews and updates her instructions. So grab your north and bar the baz. So with some help from Bingle and a few informative searches later, what is a bar, what is a baz, how do I bar? She carefully, meticulously bars the baz. She looks up and sees a single step, whoop, <laughs> has appeared on her side of the canyon. Yay, so exciting. <laughs> and then she waits. Yeah, and nothing else happens. Um, she's one step closer, but she has a long way to go. So she's back to having to ask a question. So she writes a note. She says, I've successfully barred the baths. I have a step of my bridge now. Thank you. What do I do now to finish my bridge? A reply arrives, and it advises, great news. Now just keep at it. You have to bar a lot of bazes to finish building your bridge across this canyon. So she bars the baz again. She gets another step. Then she bars the baz again. Yep. So back in Reddit land, a tenderfoot Redditor asks, is it OK if I'm successfully going through Code Academy lessons while not fully understanding some of them? And they describe their situation. They say, I'm about halfway through the Python course, and it's not quite clicking yet. I haven't been having any problems with the lessons, but sometimes I'll type the code in, and it will be correct, but I'll not understand why it worked. Should I just keep going and not worry about fully understanding it until I have more of a grip on the language? So as Tenderfeet began building this bridge across the canyon, they're gaining consciousness of their incompetence. They're learning to identify where and what they don't know. That Redditor recognizes there's pieces of understanding they're missing, but they can't quite identify what those pieces are. <laughs> this halfway point between unconscious incompetence and conscious incompetence is where a lot of those oh or duh moments start to happen. Raven Covington told me about one of those first moments she encountered where she said, I didn't realize how easily you can type something wrong and break your program. It seems very obvious to me now. But she was running into an issue where something just wasn't working. And so when she showed it to someone, she was just missing a comma or something. She said it didn't occur to her at first that the computer needed to know exactly what she wanted it to do. Zed Shaw describes those, that necessary repetition she's performing in the intro of his book series, Learn Code the Hard Way. He says, keep at it, force yourself. If you run into something you don't understand, skip it, come back to it later. Just keep going, because with programming, there's this very odd thing that happens. At first, you will not understand anything, then one day, Bang. Your brain will snap and you will suddenly get it. So some of this repetition can get a little lonely, but there are things she's just going to have to learn on her own. She's going to have to have her own moments of, oh, and duh. She's counting on that bang, now I get it, that Zed Shaw promises. So with each of these moments that she encounters, she's inching her way across the canyon. She's learning what she has to learn. So her head's down, she's focusing on all of the bases she has to bar. She's getting steadily across the bridge. She now has vocabulary, tools, resources, and the ability to ask better questions all in her knapsack. She has people on the other side to answer her questions, and she sees a goal. The mountain is in sight. So she'll have to continue barring the baths, but by the time she reaches the other side of the canyon, she has more informed questions. She wonders, what happens if I baz the bar? How bad is a bazizzle? I know I needed a north, but what if I'd used a foo? 
She might not even understand the answers to these questions, but that's for the next stage of learning. That's what will help propel her further up the mountain. So she's about to take her first step into the safer, brighter side of the canyon. She's got community, she's got people to learn with. So everyone's just very happy. This is a very happy slide. But if this were a board game, we're about to add the Pioneer Expansion Pack. Now she has to accomplish all of the same things, but without any help from anyone on the other side. This tenderfoot has to find, she has to be the first to find her way out of a forest, stumble to the ledge of a canyon, and figure out how to get across. She doesn't see anyone on the other side, no one that looks familiar, no one that she recognizes as a helper, so she has no confidence that she can get across because if no one else has, what makes her so special? What does this look like in the real world? Well, you've probably seen that image. I know you've probably definitely seen this image. This is what it looks like in the real world. And it doesn't look super great, but what's worse is how it feels when you fall into one or even several of one of these underrepresented categories. When someone falls into those categories, they don't necessarily see someone as a beacon of success. So they don't have someone to immediately go to to ask a question very comfortably. So they might not even ask. Stephanie Magdiapai Herrera, I think I said that correctly, will, she wrote about the importance of seeing people early in the learning process. She said, Pers prospective and current students need to be able to see people like them in interview rooms and in classroom podiums. She says at every level of those organizations, from boardrooms to HR, and the value of this kind of presence is immeasurable. Knowing that that kind of presence is all too rare, many established previous pioneers are working to improve this. Dominic M. Liddell founded Coding While Black because he kept hearing people say, well, if we could find them, we'd hire them. And he wanted to say, no, we are here, and we want you to find us. So, once you arrive, you see no one. The joy that someone might feel when they do see someone is huge. There's this blog post by Ashley Nelson Hornstein that I really love, where she talks about discovering a new hero, Annie Jean Easley. Does anyone know who she is? Nope, all right. So she was an African-American computer programmer who worked for what would become NASA. It wasn't even NASA yet in the 1950s through the 80s. And Ashley, she learned about Annie Jean Easley on Twitter and just couldn't get enough. She just was consuming information and talking to everyone about her. She says, having visible examples of people that look like you in an aspirational professional field is powerful. By merely existing, these examples prove that there's an achievable pathway to that field. Ashley talked to her friends about Easley's life and even got to meet Dr. Yvonne Cagle, who is a NASA astronaut. And when Ashley told Dr. Cagle about Easley and showed her her photo, she said Dr. Cagle had a tangible emotional reaction because Anna Jean Easley was a pioneer. She figured out her own way across the canyon. But since Easley wasn't readily visible, Dr. Cagle had to be a pioneer as well when she was building her own bridge across the canyon towards becoming an astronaut. So what can be done as a community to improve visibility, to aid our tender feet? Whether you find yourself in an under or overrepresented category of humans, <laughs> how do we improve the bridge building process to help get pioneers to the other side? So I actually feel like this conference has done a really good job. I don't know if anyone, I've seen a few tweets about people really praising the diversity, but What's important to me is I've seen diverse attendance, but I've also seen diverse speakers, and that stuff really matters. Affinity groups and events like Black Girls Code, AlterConf, and RailsBridge, they help members of underrepresented groups find familiar faces and act as beacons to help guide and encourage people and pioneering tender feet across the canyon. 
So hopefully now, more and more pioneering tenderfeet can send a paper airplane to someone they identify with and recognize. So we can ask ourselves what we are doing to lift up and who we're making visible in our own communities, whether local or global, and what events and groups we're funding and, and promoting. And are we, from our mountain of competence, sending the right messages and responses to these new would-be members of our community, whether they're a pioneer or not? Each message we craft, whether in person or online, should recognize the relative difficulty of the journey they've begun. And with each well-crafted message and interaction, we're helping Tenderfeet bridge that treacherous canyon while helping them overcome that first major obstacle in their learning path. So with each bridge built, our mountain community grows. And with each bridge built, we gain traveling companions with different experiences and different skill sets. Because the upcoming obstacles we might face might be completely new to you or me, but might be something familiar to one of these new developers. So with that shared and, un and different experience, we can solve new and exciting problems together. We just have to get them across first. So thank you very much. I want to say thanks to Tam Vo. She was my coworker at one point, and she worked with me on the illustrations. And uh, she is a pioneering bridge builder herself, so she's awesome. Check her out on Twitter and see what she's up to. She's always doing something new. And if you want to stay in touch, uh, here's my information. I work at Mailchimp. I'm an engineering manager in Atlanta, and I'm a co-organizer of a monthly meetup called Rails Girls Atlanta. We also do workshops here and there. And um, we've had a few pretty awesome success stories. So if that's the sort of thing you're into talking about, come talk to me. All right. Thank you again.